So tonight is our third session in this series, and it is a two-part session. The first part of this session will be presented by Yolanda Duckworth and will provide an overview of the state's Office of Public Health Opioid Prevention Program Awareness through outreach, as well as share information on prescription medication safety and disposal as a continued strategy to reduce opioid misuse and overdose. The second part of our session will be presented by Walter Abney and will provide education on the use and administration of the opioid overdose reversal medication, Narcan. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Yolanda to you. Yolanda has been with us each week and we're happy to welcome her tonight as a presenter. Yolanda is the Region 7 Opioid Awareness Coordinator for the Louisiana Department of Health Office of Public Health located in Shreveport. As the opioid co coordinator, Yolanda is responsible for partnering with organizations such as the Bossier Parish Libraries to, to share life-saving information regarding harm reduction and medication safety and opioid awareness education. Yolanda serves on various coalitions that in some way allows her to reach others with her opioid awareness messages and information. Um, so Yolanda, we are looking forward to hearing from you tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Mandy, for your introduction. Um, and it has been, and it's always very informative to me as well to hear presenters from um, other areas of um, our world of opioid education and addiction. So um, tonight we will um, discuss um, easy and um, hopefully um, memorable ways that when we have medication um, left over, uh, whether they be prescriptions or over the counter, um, we will now learn how to properly dispose of them. As Mandy mentioned, I am Region 7 Opioid Outreach Coordinator for Region 7, which covers the parishes that you see on your screen. And at any time um, you wish for me to um, speak with your organization um, or coalition, um, I will be more than happy to schedule um, that uh, program. So about the opioid crisis, Roughly 21 to 29% of patients prescribed prescription opioids for chronic pain misuse them. Um, that's, that's a scary um, percentage. Between eight and 12% develop an opioid use disorder. Out of them, an estimated four to 6% who misuse prescription opioids transition into harder uh, drugs, uh, heroin for one. About 80% of people who use heroin first misuse prescription opioids. The Louis Louisiana's approach to combat the opioid epidemic are as follows. We provide safe, effective, non-addictive strategies to manage chronic pain because we understand that chronic pain is real um, for various reasons. And um, our, uh, one of our main priorities is to make sure that the public know that there are alternatives and to seek those alternatives through their healthcare providers um, to offer new innovative medication assistant treatment, MAT, and technologies to treat opioid use disorders. We are constantly seeing new uh, MAT clinics um, around the region to um, offer this service. Um, one in particular in Claiborne Parish offer um, medication assistant treatment within their um, treatment facility. So um, we're really um, happy to know that this is available for someone who um, is, um, struggling with OUD, opioid use disorder. Um, also Im improved opioid overdose prevention and reversal interventions, Narcan, which um, 
we will hear more about in this later in this presentation and to offer the PMP program, the prescription monitoring program, which is an electronic database um, that uh, tracks and control how prescriptions are uh, dispensed throughout the state um, with healthcare providers. And lastly, harm reduction strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. So you've probably, if you've been on um, these uh, community conversations, you probably know what opioids are at this point. But for the sake of um, clarity, for those who may not, um, opioids act on parts of the brain that control pain. They also affect the areas of the brain that control breathing. During an opioid overdose, breathing can slow or stop which can cause loss of consciousness, coma, or worst case, death. So most opioids are derived from opium, the poppy plant. And um, these are a few of the common um, derivatives of opioids. And here's another list of more. Almost 70% of more than 67,000 drug overdose deaths in 2018 involved an opioid. I don't know about you, but to me, whenever I um, share this slide or read more statistics like this, it is very alarming. So, which is, um, it makes me even more proud to be able to share information such as this um, with uh, our community just to continue to have these conversations and to continue to share this information to others, letting them know um, that opioid death does not have to happen as often as they do if we use safety precautions. Harm reduction strategies that we'll talk about this evening are safe dosing, safe storage, and safe disposal. So safe medication doses, dosage is just that, um, trying to um, modify and control how you're taking your medications. And so here are some tips that can help you and or a family member um, do just that, to create a daily routine to take your prescriptions. So, um, I usually take my allergy medications in the morning. Um, some people will take their medications at lunchtime with a meal, some in the evening. Um, so just primarily getting a routine, uh, a specific time so that it'll be um, just automatic that you'll remember, your memory will um, be jogged so that you'll know that, yeah, it's breakfast time, so it's time to take my medicine. Find creative ways to help you remember. Um, setting an alarm is always good, but if that's not available, most of us, all of us, I would say, um, have a cell phone. So setting a timer on your cell phone or a reminder on your cell phone, or if you're at work, if you have to take your medications during lunchtime, just set um, a reminder on your computer. Um, never discontinue to take medications unless your doctor or your healthcare provider tells you to do so. Um, you don't want to discontinue a medication because that may um, limit your uh, progress in whatever illness that um, you're taking the medication for. If you miss a dosage, however, consult your doctor or your healthcare provider immediately um, as to when to restart taking your medications. Keep a record of all of your medications, even your over-the-counter, your OTC meds. Um, this serves as multiple purposes. Um, you'll always know um, what you're taking. And then when you go to the doctor, what's the first thing you know your doctor asks you uh, when your nurse is triaging you? Uh, what meds are you taking? So you'll always have this available and updated um, as often as your medications are updated. And I want to stress this one. 
never, ever share your prescriptions, whether they be over the counter um, or prescription opioids, because those medications were prescribed for you. And someone else's reaction to those medications could be totally different, even if they are over the counter than um, you would react to them. So never ever share. And please emphasize this with younger people in your family. Um, because oftentimes, you know, teenagers, you know, may be at a sporting event and, you know, hurt their arm. And, you know, another uh, kid will say, well, I have an aspirin or I have an Advil. Um, yeah, it may look like an Advil, um, but they don't really know if that's what it is. And we'll do a little um, scenarios just to see how uh, well you know the difference between um, real or not real medication. Use one pharmacy or pharmacist. Um, this helps with consistency. Um, I know I've been using the same pharmacy for at least 12 years. And so they know me. They, they know me by name, by face. They even know my family members because if I'm sick and I can't go to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription, I have a family member to do so and um, they learn them as well. Um, and and it, it just makes, you know, having all of your medications in one location easier for you as well. Keep all prescriptions out of reach of children, pets, and others. This too is very important. If you have leftover pills, safely dispose of them. And we'll talk about how you can do that a little later on. Approximately 80% of opioid emergencies from overdose are deemed accidental. People who misuse um, opioids, um, it, it's not a suicide attempt um, and for the most part. Um, it's accidental. Maybe they have taken too much of a prescription or they have taken a prescription that they thought was one thing, but it turned out to be something else, which again, I can emphasize to never share your medications. Other facts, according to John, a John Hopkins study, um, says that 60% uh, of people keep leftover opioids for future use. Okay, yeah, I had that car injury and that my, my shoulder, you know, uh, was sore for a while. I'll just keep these lower tabs just in case if I have a really bad headache. Bad idea. Always discard of unused medications. 20% shared their medications. We already discussed that. 8% um, will likely share their medications with a friend. And again, stress this with younger um, family members. Um, it's just really important, especially at that young age, you just have no idea what, what you're getting. 14% will likely share their opioids with a relative. You know, a relative come up, comes over to your house and has a really bad headache. You don't have any ibuprofen um, or acetaminophen. So, oh, I have these lower tabs. So I'll just, you know, cut it in half and that should help never do that. 10% say that they securely lock their opioids. And anyone taking opioids should always, always keep those medications under secure lock and key. And we'll talk more about that as well. So let's just stop and um, let's test our knowledge of what we would consider an actual medication or what is not. So we have um, two pictures here of what look like um, pills. So um, I, please unmute your phone if you think you know the answer. Which do you think is a medication, one or two? Anybody? No one? Number one looks real. Number two looks yes. okay. All right, let's find out. And you were right. Number one is um, aspirin-free pain reliever. And and what made you um, say that number one 
was the medication? <clears throat> well, number one, it um, it just looked real. Number two kind of looks looked like it may have been um, like the edges look a little brittle or things mm -hmm. like that. And then the first one is kind of smooth all the way around. So. Very good. Very good. Yes. Yes. Very, very good. Thank you. All right. What about these two? Is one real or two the real one? I'll say two. Two, okay. I think one. <laughs> okay, all right. We have varying answers. Very good. Anybody else? All right, well, let's see. So one was an orange flavored breath mint and two was a gas relief over the counter medication. You see how easily they can be unidentifiable because they look so similar. And think about children that, and pets, um, seeing bright, shiny colored something. First thing they'll want to do is to what? Ingest them. So we, we want to make sure that we keep those things away from others. All right, what about these two? One. Maybe I've one. just had too much candy, but I think number one is candy <laughs> and I think number two is medicine. Okay, all right, let's see, let's see. And you are right, um, they are sour candy and number two are the chewable. Yeah, pain releasers. So yeah. And I think this is the last one. These are very, very similar. And I put these here because they are so similar in appearance. I'll say one. Okay, one. Anyone else? All right. One is an aspirin, two is a mint. Absolutely. Very good. Very good. So we talked a little bit um, about storing your medications. Um, so here are some suggestions for how you can do that. Use a secured or locked device and you can get them there um, on your screen, the bottom, I guess it would be the bottom left-hand side. Um, you can get them from um, Walmart, Target um, for under $10 and to potentially save a life and to make sure that you're keeping your um, pain medication safe, I think that's a very wise investment. Um, keep out of sight of children and pets. We talked about that. Keep track of your um, usage of your medication. Um, when using a weekly pill box, um, note the remaining pills and then put them back in your um, pill box. And then just kind of have like a little note for yourself of how many you have left. Um, never leave prescriptions on your countertops or in medicine cabinet. Why would that be dangerous to keep medications on the countertop? A little kid can't get on the countertop, but why would that be a bad idea to do that or in a medicine cabinet? Anybody? Like you have visitors and they use your bathroom? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, visitors could be family even. Um, and, you know, uh, just keeping um, those prescriptions out of sight will hopefully keep out of mind of someone who is possibly um, misusing opioids. Very good. All right, so how do we dispose, <clears throat> excuse me, of those um, medications? Here is an FDA flush list. These are medications that are approved by the FDA that can be flushed um, or um, placed in a sink disposal. Um, so you can find this on any FDA website, um, but I just wanted to show, um, it's not a very long list. So we need to learn how to dispose of them. So here are some tips. Um, that you can easily do when um, 
wanting to know what to do with those leftover meds. So mix them in cat litter or um, coffee grinds or dirt or sand um, and pour the peels in them, um, put them in a Ziploc bag and throw them away. But after you've thrown all of the peels or the liquid um, out of the bottle, make sure that you um, discard of any personal identification on your pill bottles. And that's because we don't want anyone to um, take your prescription bottle if you have uh, remaining refills and get them filled. And then there are medical safety boxes that you can also dispose of your medications. Um, in Region 7, all of the CVS and Walgreens have um, pill dis medication uh, dispense boxes. Um, many of the rural sheriff's offices, I know in Claiborne Parish, Minden, most of, most of our parishes, uh, Red River, for sure, Caddo and Bossier, um, those drop boxes are located at either the sheriff's uh, department office or the police department. And then twice a year, there's a um, DEA National Drug Take Back Day. And they are held across the country, uh, one in the spring, usually in April, and one in the fall, usually in October. Those are very well publicized. And um, the locations um, here in our region is at Cattle Parish Sheriff Safety Town. Um, off of Jewella Avenue. So at this point, um, I want to just, you know, share a little bit more detail about how to dispose of your medication. So I'll turn my screen back over to Mandy um, to show that video. I'm on it. Okay, thank you. Unused medicines can spell many things. Risk, if they're taken by someone they weren't prescribed for. Harm, if accidentally taken by a child or pet. Danger, or even death, if not used as directed. Unused or expired medicines may be hiding right in your home, in bathrooms, kitchens, bedrooms, purses and anywhere you store medicines. So why put your family at risk? Safely dispose of unused or expired medicines before they can do harm. There are many ways to get rid of them. The best option is to find a drug take-back location. This could be a local pharmacy or a police station. These take-back locations may offer on-site medicine drop-off boxes, mail-back programs, or in-home disposal products. DEA's webpage can help you find a take-back location near you. Just enter your zip code. If you don't have a drug take-back location near you, check the FDA's flush list to see if your medicine is on it. Medicines on the flush list may be especially dangerous with just one dose if they're taken by children, pets, or others in your home. Flushing certain types of medicines, such as opioids, helps keep everyone safe by making sure these powerful drugs are not accidentally or intentionally swallowed, touched, or misused. Remember, don't flush any medicine unless it is on the flush list. If you don't have a drug take-back location nearby and your medicine is not on the flush list, you can dispose of it in the trash. For medicines you dispose of in the trash, FDA recommends that you mix them with an unappealing substance such as dirt, cat litter, or used coffee grounds. Don't crush pills. Then place the mixture in a sealed plastic bag before throwing it away. Scratch out personal information from the prescription label on the empty packaging. For complete details and instructions on safe medicine disposal, visit www.fda.gov slash drug disposal.
Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Mandy. No problem. Am I sharing my screen? No. Yes. Okay, there we go. You are now. Okay, great. Okay. All right. So well. There is help available. These are um, sites and locations um, that can help if you know of someone who needs more information on um, harm reduction strategies. Um, in our region, we have, well, across the state of Louisiana, we have 211 um, that offers information on various topics. Um, of services that are available in the area code wherever you're calling from. Of course, the Louisiana Department of Health, um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, also um, commonly called SAMHSA, CDC, uh, the Louisiana um, Human Services District, Northwest Louisiana, um, and then here I uh, made available the flush list is www fda.gov that will give you a listing of all of the medications that are approved on the flush list. So now um, we will turn it over to part two of our harm reduction presentation um, and um, that will be on the Narcan uh, administration. So thank you all very much. If you have any questions I will entertain them at this time. If not, I will pass the torch on to Walter. If you have any questions for Yolanda, please feel free to unmute yourself or you can type your questions in the chat. Thank you all. Thank you, Mandy. Yes. So um, we're going to go ahead and proceed with the second part of this session. If you guys think of any questions for Yolanda or that come about for the second session, again, feel free to put them in the chat. We will address those at the end. Our second presenter this evening is Walter Abney. Walter is a peer recovery specialist and the prevention specialist with the Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. Walter has been in recovery from drugs and alcohol for 12 years and has been with CADA for four years. His main goal in his role at CADA is to help people addicted to drugs and alcohol find a new way of living free from addiction and to lead productive lives. Walter, we are looking forward to hearing from you and I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, <clears throat> good evening everyone. Um, hope everybody's doing okay today. I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. As uh, Mandy said, thank you again. My name is Lloyd Abney, but I go by Walter and I'm the Cater Prevention Specialist and, peer and a Peer Recovery Support Specialist at the Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse of Northwest Louisiana. Um, a few of the things that Cater does and what we provide, we do outpatient, in, um, intensive outpatient treatment, high intensity, high intensity residential, low intensity residential, family residential. And we also have a Pit Tootsie Davis program, which is for family members and friends who have someone who's addicted to drugs or alcohol. We do, at Cato, we do prevention, education, as well as treatment. And so that stand, the acronym for that is PET. And what is PET? We do use substance use disorders, overdoses, and deaths. Uh, this is just a basic 
diagram of the the um, addiction cycle and the overdose event. You have, um, and it, as you can see, a lot of times it is a very, very kind of circular event. You know, there's a, it starts, you can start anywhere in this model, but normally it starts with treatment, there's a remission state. And sometimes following that remission, uh, you can have an overdose event, which can lead to death, or it can take you back around to the circle where you get the treatment that you need as well as, uh, or go on, you know, and it can continue as long as it goes untreated or the person stops doing the things that they were taught to do during their treatment. Um, these are. This is just some information that I found on um, overdoses in Louisiana from 2014 to 2018. And if you notice, where with all opioids, the uh, it goes up yearly, and it's going up and up and up. And then the synthet synthetic opioids are getting higher as well, and fentanyl which is one of the strongest opioids found on the streets or is um, becoming more popular too. I do um, outreach with different sheriff departments in the and police departments in the state. And as I was talking with uh, a policeman down in Natchitoches, I went to give, you know, to pass out Narcan to uh, the Natchitoches Police Department. And he told me it was something that was very needed in their area. And because not only are we finding fentanyl in like heroin or mixed with other opioids, they're also found in, he said everything he had, he's had tested this year has come back from the lab with traces of fentanyl in it, marijuana, um, any kind of any kind of drug you can think of. I was talking to, I don't know if any of y'all know Hershey at the Philadelphia Center. She was the first person that told me this, that people are thinking that they're um, using crystal meth and end up overdosing on opioids because fentanyl is mixed into the crystal meth. Now that was the that was actually the first time I had heard of that when she when I was talking with her one day. Uh, so it's Narcan is something that's needed for all people that use any kind of drug now. Uh, as you can see, this is the graph of the, the graph of the different drugs and their uh, overdoses to drugs that were taken during during that event. And as I said, I'm the prevention specialist at CADA and I cover like region seven. So all nine parishes in Northwest Louisiana, I go around and talk to the people in their areas in those areas about Norcan and we also distribute the terror bags for safe disposal as Yolanda was speaking of earlier. Um, now, these are some of the prescribing rates in for opioids in, uh, um, in different areas around the state of Louisiana. And you can see it's, it's way too high, if, in my opinion, where, you know, everyone is just giving these strong opioids to people for um, different various reasons, I suppose. We also use, uh, as a model, sometimes we use the Generation RX program. It discusses the scope, causes, and consequences of misusing prescription drugs. It identifies four key messages for safe medication practices and also this helps discuss how you can take action at home or in your community to educate others about safe medication practices. We have, it's broken down into different 
age levels. There's an age level for elementary students, middle school and high school, young adults, old um, adults, as well as older adults. So whatever um, demographic you're talking with is something for everyone there that you can that can be used. Um, some of the goals and things for Generation Rx are only use prescription medications as directed by a health professional. Never share your prescription medication with others or use someone else's medication. Always store properly and be a good example to those around you by modeling the safe med medication taking practices. As I said earlier, we also do um, disposal bags. And this is uh, the brand of bag that we uh, we give away. These are free to the public. Uh, I would just need to know. You can call Cater and just tell them that you need um, some safe disposal bags and we'll be able to bring them out to you. We also have some medication drop boxes as you learned to talk about. Uh, we have some few of those down that we can place but we run sometimes we run into problems with those because with giving them away because nobody seems to want to be responsible for the medication once it's disposed of which is weird that's why most of the time you find that at those around police stations or um pharmacies Um, these are some of the places that we do have drop boxes right now. We have one in it. As I said, the Soda Sheriff Station. It's, at, it's actually the one, it's the Sheriff Substation in Logansport down in DeSoto Parish. Okay, now as for Narcan, um, it comes, Narcan basically, first of all, First of all, Narcan is an opioid antagonist. How it works, it there are opioid receptors on the brain, and once it's inhaled, it uh, cleans off the opioid receptor, knocks the op knocks the opiate off of that opioid receptor, and re and is there to you know helps resuscitate the person who's overdosed. Um, it attaches to, like I said, naloxone is only capable of, of reversing opioid overdoses. However, if you give it to someone who you feel might have overdosed or say they haven't taken any opioid, it won't hurt them, but it won't wake them up. So, you know, it's like one of those things. If the person hasn't op overdosed on opioids, it won't hurt them if you give it to them. On the box, as I showed you earlier, there's a flap for anyone who wants to use a marking. Uh, and there's a easy quick start guide. And it tells you there's a flap right there. Or also there's a pamphlet on the inside of the box once you open it. But in that box, there are two um, doses of the medicine. And it tells you to identify the opioid overdose and check for, for a response. Then give the person the Narcan nasal spray. Then call for emergency help. Turn them over on the side and call for emergency help. Signs of an opioid overdose that you'll be looking for is the blue tint to your lips, fingers, and skin. Breathing is slow, irregular, or stopped. And if you can see into their eyes, their pupils are very small, sometimes called pinpoint pupils. And they have an unusual sleepiness or drowsiness. Now, when you give the person the dose of Norcan, you just take it out of the box, and there's a nozzle. You place the nozzle into their nostril and press, press the plunger firmly into the nose. And when they breathe that in, it'll take, sometimes it'll take a few minutes for them to respond. 
Uh, something I always try to tell people when they are doing it is it's not like you see on TV where when they give it, when they give them the Narcan, a lot of times they give them a Narcan shot or the dose in the nose. It's not like when they see on TV, everybody wakes up all happy and or confused, like what's going on, what happened. Most of the time when the people wake up, the person will wake up angry and very combative. A lot of times, um, it's almost like a fight. But the reason for that is, is Narcan, once it, the Naloxone knocks the, cleans off the opioid receptor, I guess it does a very good job of it because that person is immediately thrown into, it's, it's like they're in the third day of opioid withdrawal. So they they wake up with their body hurting, they're sick, they're, you know, and the main thing they want to do is go back and get some more. A lot of times they will actually, if it's given to them by a paramedic, they'll actually refuse to be taken to the hospital. And a lot of people think it, that's because they're afraid of being arrested or something of that nature, which that is some of it, but a lot of it is because they are actually thrown into withdrawal. And the only thing they can think about is going back to get more. Also, once you've given the naloxone to the person, uh, it's very short acting. It'll wake them up, but it might not be good for 10, 15, 20 minutes, maybe. So you still want to call 911. It's a, and the person can lose consciousness, consciousness again. And it, as it says, it's not a replacement for emergency services. You want to give them that to get them back breathing, but then make sure you have 911 on the way. The ideal way to do this is with two people. Somebody's on the phone 911 while the other person is administering the marking. And all you can call if you need it. A lot of times as well, I've seen people, one of the major questions I get is because People are so can't, you know, the first thing they want to know is can they get in trouble for giving Narcan? Louisiana has a good Samaritan law. Whereas if you are helping someone that's in an emergency, you cannot be sued or found liable for anything that goes wrong when you're actually trying to help that person in good faith. And that goes not only for doctors, but that goes for any person in Louisiana with any kind of knowledge of, you know, even with CPR and different things like that. You know, because a lot of times people say somebody doing CPR and they'll break a rib and the person wants to sue them. They can't because of that Good Samaritan law. And that's about it for me. Does anybody have any comments, questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions for Walter. No questions? I don't have a question, but I put it in the chat. I didn't know about the Good Samaritan Law. That's really interesting to know. I didn't know about that either. Yeah, uh, it's one of those deals I... Uh, I looked it up because actually my sister was telling me about it. My sister works in Maryland and she says, when I first started this job, she wanted, she said, make sure that Louisiana still has a good Samaritan law. So you can tell the people, so they won't be afraid to help. A lot of times people are afraid to help people, like even giving people CPR, like I said, because they're thinking that something could go wrong and then they want to be sued if something happens. So that's what that Good Samaritan law is for. And it's there's a form of that law in all 50 states in a bunch of other countries around the world as well, from my reading. All right, thank you. Any questions from 
Oh, so we do have a question in the chat. Um, how would we help someone get into CADA? You can call that number that I gave you. Um, and there are steps to that per the, if the person is an adult, we would have to, someone here in our screening department will do a screening on them. And then the clinical supervised clinical team will decide uh, if what level of care they need, and then they'll be called and placed in that level of care after. But the initial, the initial point is you call that number 222-8511 and someone will get a screening to, done. And, but like I said, if it's an adult, they have to call themselves. A lot of people think they can call for someone, but they can't. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. No? All right, well, thank you so much, Yolanda and Walter. Those were wonderful presentations, learned a lot. Um, I just want to thank everyone for attending. Um, and I wanna remind you that there will be a recording of the session on our website at bossierlibrary.org backslash community dash conversations. And we do hope to see you all next week at our next session. Thank you, thank you all.